Then thanks for coming. Uh, so this talk will be about the Perun framework, which is uh, you can see as a toolkit for blockchain scalability, for increasing uh, the transaction throughput, and for enabling also transactions across blockchains. Uh, for example, regarding blockchain uh, cross-chain swaps, uh, Perun is a hyperledger labs project currently. Um, it is maintained by Bosch, the German company, and um, the startup Polycrypt, so I'm a software architect at Polycrypt. The project itself started as a research project at the University of Darmstadt in Germany, and uh, we founded a small startup company from that, and also have some other projects, but this will focus on Peru. Um, so what are we addressing? I already briefly touched upon it. Um, uh, we are addressing scalability and interoperability, so as you know, a blockchain gives us a trustless transaction layer for exchanging value, for doing payments, but also, um, especially when we look at public blockchain networks such as Ethereum or Bitcoin, um, these have a lot of nodes and um, there are inherent um, transaction throughput limits with these public blockchains. So we see, for example, in the case of Ethereum and Bitcoin, we can do globally between 10 and 20 transactions per second. And this is something that we wanted to address with the research initially. It turns out um, that the same technology is also capable of solving a different problem that arised more recently. So we see more and more different uh, blockchain networks coming up. The assets are fragmented, the users are fragmented across the networks, and um, yeah, there's, as you know, a uh, need for interoperability solutions so that assets, for example, from different networks can be exchanged against each other. Um, so how does the protocol work? So this, as I said, it stems from a research project, and this slide should give you a very rough idea how it works on a protocol level. The basic idea is that we try to push as many of the transactions off the chain so that there is no um, on-chain transaction costs and no on-chain limitations. And only in the case of an off-chain dispute, so if we run into a dispute with other parties that we are interacting with, then we use a smart contract to resolve the disputes. And the crucial point is that we don't really want to sacrifice any security guarantees that we typically have. So we still want to do that in a trustless way where we don't need to rely on a trusted intermediary. So here you can see the typical uh, transaction scheme when working with a blockchain. And for us, it looks a little bit like this. So we have this off-chain protocol. Um, for entering the off-chain system, we do um, maybe a few on-chain transactions for exiting the system or for disputing. But as long as we're in an, exec uh, an optimistic execution, we can do transactions across the parties in, this, in the off-chain system without any on-chain interaction. But there's a guarantee that any transaction that we do off-chain will eventually be possible to settle against the layer one. And Perun, as I mentioned, is an instance of such a protocol. There are other protocols as well. Perun is based on state channel technology, that's the technical term, and is one instance of such a scaling protocol. So today I want to tell you a little bit more about the history of the project, how it evolved from a research uh, project into a startup company and a Hyperledger Labs project, um, then give you an overview of the framework, its component, the protocols, maybe if we have time, also tell you a bit about the technical details, like how the architecture looks like, how the API looks like, and finally tell you about applications that we're currently working on or that we see um, as potential um, useful applications of the, of the technology. So, yeah, as I mentioned, we started, um, I think the research started actually back in 2016 or something like that, and then it always takes time to formulate the ideas, to write it down. And finally, the, the papers got published um, in the middle 
uh, of 2018, beginning of 2019, I think, um, at well-renowned uh, computer security conferences, Eurocrypt, uh, ACM, CCS, IEEE, SMP, um, and that was focusing on building state channel networks. So um, we cannot just have one state channel that has a fixed set of parties, but we can actually build state channels on top of state channels in order to build, for example, a payment network where the creation of new state channels doesn't require on-chain interactions. And that's also what these uh, papers focus on. And on top of that, you can actually run smart contracts inside such a, such a state channel. And yeah, all the protocols are in these papers. Um, then um, we wanted to build out the protocols into a library and uh, in the middle of 2018 we got some funding from the Ethereum Foundation which basically kick-started this endeavor of making uh, some software product out of it. Also early on we got interest from the company Bosch. Uh, unfortunately uh, a colleague from Bosch couldn't be here today due to visa reasons um, but yeah they engaged with us already I think also in the middle of 2018 and in the beginning of 2019, we had the first proof of concept implementation, um, which was not an open source library now to, as today, but uh, still something that we could already show. Um, then also something that was very helpful for us in Germany, there is um, funding from the government um, for transitioning a research project to a startup company and received, received some funding from that. So that helped us really work individually without too much uh, investor pressure or something like that on the project. Um, we also then in the end of 2019 released the first version of the library. Um, yeah, and since then it's publicly available on GitHub. Uh, I will point to the repositories at the end. Um, we continue to develop new features. Basically, we just started with simple payment channels in the beginning, and by, by today we can do payment channel networks. We can also do arbitrary execution logic in a payment channel, uh, in, a, in a state channel. Uh, we have cross-chain functionality by now, so we continue to add new features, but on an organization level at some point. Uh, it was suggested by Bosch that we join the Hyperledger Foundation as a labs project because it gives us a common neutral ground um, to work together without having the problem of who owns what. It's just open source and there's no, we don't have to decide if the repository lies at the Bosch org or the uh, Polycrypt org, which is the, co the company name and so on. Um, yeah, and as I already hinted, the company, uh, until that point, it was still located at the university and then at the end of 2020 we founded a company called Polycrypt uh, which is still tightly located um, related to the university group of uh, Professor Sebastian Faust. Um, we still have offices in the university so that's also quite nice. Um, yeah, Then we got another round of funding for basically transitioning further into a, a self-sustainable company. And we received um, also quite some interest from other blockchain foundations, so from Polkadot specifically, uh, from Definity, uh, and basically integrated or are still working on integrating um, the Perun protocols uh, for their blockchains so that potential application users can also work with these different blockchains. Uh, this year, a focus was really on the application side, so we are kind of a technology provider, but of course, in the end, technology is only useful if you have good applications for it. And one um, instance of that came through a connection with the Polkadot space. So Ayuna is a startup company which also received some funding from Polkadot, and they're focusing on, focusing on um, providing gaming-based blockchain applications and making it easy for uh, game developers to use blockchain but they hit um, a limitation in terms of how far they could scale their application so they wanted real-time interaction in their games but they couldn't do it with other scaling technology and that's how they get interested to, into Perun and I will talk a little bit more later about how that works. 
Yeah, and recently we also published um, an integration for Hyperledger Fabric and are also now developing an integration for Cardano, which is a different type of blockchain. It's UTXO based, so quite a different model, but it looks like our abstractions and our protocols also work uh, for, yeah, for UTXO based blockchains with some smart contract functionality. All right, so um, yeah, with that, we have the history part done and um, I would like to give you as first uh, a bit of an overview of how the protocols work, but then also what are the components and maybe also how the architecture of uh, the implementation looks like. So um, the prerequisite for using Perun is yeah, independent of how you implement it. When you want to use it, you have to deploy a smart contract on a chosen blockchain. So we are compatible with different types of blockchains, but independent of which blockchain it is, you have to deploy a Perun smart, smart contract with a certain functionality for dispute resolution. Um, by the way, is this sound all right or should I? Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, I have a small echo, but it's fine. Um, so, and then the next thing is, okay, we, we need an off-chain, we have an off-chain agreement protocol for um, uh, two parties to agree that they want to in engage in an off-chain interaction. So, um, once they have that off-chain agreement, basically by signing uh, the channel parameters, they can then um, open the channel by funding uh, into this globally unique channel ID, making a fund transaction into the smart contract. And now these funds, these assets will be reserved for that particular channel where only these two parties have access to. So maybe when the channel is open in a very simple case, it would say Alice have five, has five tokens and Bob has also five tokens in the channel. So now the channel is open and the funds are locked and we can now do uh, transactions off chain Basically, Alice can say, I want to make a transfer, a payment transfer to Bob of five tokens. So Bob has uh, balance uh, 10 afterwards and Alice has balance zero. They both sign the new state. And since they both signed it, the smart contract can later realize, okay, now this is the state with the highest version number, which has signatures from all parties in the channel. So I will accept it later. Um, so we can basically do this thousand times per second because it only requires a little bit of network interaction and signatures. Um, it doesn't involve any on-chain fees and you get an instant confirmation. And the protocols that we uh, have guarantee that anything that you um, agree on off-chain, you can eventually settle on-chain. So there's a protocol guarantee that you can eventually do that. Um, so in the optimistic case, you will actually say you will finalize the off-chain interactions um, by setting a Boolean flag in the channel state. But of course, it could also happen that you cannot finalize the channel off-chain and um, one party, for example, goes offline. So in that case, we run into a dispute and now we have to decide which is the most recent state that was agreed upon. And basically, this is a challenge response protocol with some timeout logic uh, and the smart contract um, yeah, supports this. And as long as the parties are online, that's, uh, that's a necessary requirement. They will basically be able to register the most recent state that everybody has agreed on and the channel will then be settled. Um, so as I said, we also have um, different features that we can now enable in such a parent channel. Um, we can do swaps inside a channel, we can do other transaction logic so that one transaction depends on the next transaction and in case one party maybe um, signs one, the first transaction but not the second one, we have a mechanism that if these are uh, dependent on each other, we can enforce the transaction on the smart contract. So there's a mechanism basically for um, transaction enforcement in case of a dispute. And that also allows us to um, program game logic into a channel where we can basically maybe play the game 
to the end, even if one party um, already um, left the game. Um, another thing that we can do, we can also uh, have Alice on the left put assets from, from a different blockchain into the channel than Bob. So maybe Alice wants to uh, trade Ether against uh, Matic on, uh, from Bob on Polygon. And um, this uh, method also works if you have two, blockchain, uh, uh, two blockchains with two smart contracts. And the basic idea is that as long as you keep these two things uh, synchronized with each other, similar a little bit to how uh, a hash time lock works, um, you can basically fund the channel with assets from different, uh, from different blockchains. Um, all of that, or most of that, I should say, is written in the papers. We have some new protocols, especially the papers we're focusing on more on a single blockchain. Uh, we now have some new protocols uh, with the multi-chain functionality, but yeah, most of the protocols are formally analyzed, peer-reviewed, and as I mentioned, we now also have uh, cross-chain support. Um, yeah, so from an implementation perspective, how does the framework look like? So at the core, we have the GoPeroon library, and you can see that as an SDK for using that technology. So it has an implementation of the protocols at its core, and then the implementation is written, written against a set of abstract interfaces. So we have a block, blockchain abstraction, and you can basically plug in your favorite uh, blockchain module if you implement it. Um, and then the protocol will run against this blockchain. Currently we have, um, with different features enabled, we have uh, plugins for Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot, and Fabric. We are working on one for Cardano and on one for the Definity internal computer. And a similar approach we took also for the peer-to-peer -peer communication, for uh, the persistence, so in order to store the state and restore clients. Um, we can also have a modularized approach so that you can plug in your favorite database, your favorite network message broker, and so on. So we really tried to have a modular approach so that um, these protocols and this technology can be used within any um, yeah, application environment. And um, there are also some ideas now, especially from that conference, to use um, uh, Firefly, which has a similar approach um, in making um, these different components available to a blockchain application. And maybe the idea could be to reuse some components of Firefly and plug them in here or something like that. And then we have different ways of interacting with this core SDK. If you have a full client that has a high online capability, so who is online uh, for extended periods of time, and then you can use the SDK directly. Uh, otherwise, if you have a light client or an embedded device client, which is something that Bosch is especially is interested in, you can use uh, a Peru node, which is kind of, yeah, provides some additional services and a simplified user interface for light clients. Yeah, and you can all find all these uh, repositories when you go to Hyperledger Labs, search for Perun. Uh, but as I said, I will also link to them later. All right, so a little bit more detail, I think. Yeah, I should have time to show this. Um, so um, this is the architecture of the library, of the core library. And here you can see exactly what I just explained. So we have uh, the core client protocols and they work against a certain set of interfaces. This is the blockchain abstraction, which has an abstraction for wallets, accounts, um, this is the channel package is the abstraction for um, interacting basically a blockchain middle, middleware layer where we can basically, if the client wants to make an on-chain transaction, it will tell that to the channel package and the channel package will translate that um, by um, a corresponding um, chain-specific implementation into an on-chain call. And this also includes event subscriptions. And similar for the YM package, we have some um, abstraction for inter-client messaging, 
for persistence, as I just mentioned, and you can basically then plug in your favorite implementation of that. And to give you a little bit of a better idea how that actually looks like in terms of, so the library is written in Go, and this is a simplified version of the Go interfaces, but this is roughly how it looks like. So the wallet is a type that can, given an, an address, can unlock an account. An account is something that can generate a signature for a certain uh, byte array. Um, then we need some functionality for marshalling and unmarshalling, uh, for sending it over the network. Uh, and of course, we also need the capability of verifying signatures. So that's the account abstraction. And the ledger abstraction is on the right hand side. So for opening the channel, we use the funder abstraction, which basically um, must make sure, so an implementation must ensure that um, when you call fund, you specify the channel parameters that has been agreed upon in the opening protocol, the initial state, and then the funding pro uh, transaction should uh, make sure that the funding is done into the on-chain contract. Um, then we have the adjudicator, which is basically the dispute resolution mechanism and also has the, the settlement and the withdrawal capability. Um, so we have a method for registering a dispute. So we provide um, uh, the parameters, which is fixed, we provide the most recent state, and we provide signatures from all participants on the most recent state, and then the implementation should make sure um, that this dispute is registered, and we have a specification, basically, how the con smart contract implementation should look like. And then for withdraw, once um, we have um, registered a channel, we can also um, re-register in case somebody registered an old state. So this is a function that could potentially be called multiple times, but the client will know from the protocol at which point we are able to conclude uh, the dispute. And then we can finally withdraw um, the funds from, yeah, from the channel back into the account. And of course, for all of that, it is often useful and necessary for the client logic to understand, to consume events from the blockchain. And for that, we have the event subscription logic. So when we call subscribe on the adjudicator, we get an adjudicator subscription, which basically uh, yeah, allows us to consume blockchain events. Um, yeah, and then some helper functions. Uh, it's very crucial that from the parameters, we can derive a unique ID for a channel, it must be globally unique because um, in that, this is basically a hash of the participants and determines who can, in a way, who can access the channel. And if you have a duplicate ID, you would actually, by mistake, fund, uh, yeah, in, uh, potentially uh, distribute your funds to the, whole, uh, to the wrong persons. So it, it's very crucial that this is implemented in a way that you get a globally unique ID for each channel. And in practice, this works by hashing all the fixed parameter parameters into the channel, like um, yeah, the participant especially, their addresses, but also by choosing a shared random nonce so that um, yeah, you are guaranteed to get a unique value out of that that could not be predicted by others. Yeah, and then of course, we need some functionality for signing a state and for verifying a state, and that includes uh, serialization of a state. Um, so we need some functionality that of serialization so that the blockchain can basically deserialize the state, read it, and also the blockchain must be able, uh, with this blockchain-specific cryptographic signature scheme, uh, to verify the states on chain. So these things are also chain-specific because different chains have different serialization mechanisms. Uh, and different cryptographic algorithms. And these are some of the basic components that we need on-chain to make this work. So, and finally, some example of how um, uh, the API actually looks like. So, 
Um, so this is again a bit simplified, but some of it is actually real code. So um, here you can see for opening a channel, we first need to create a new client object. And here we specify a bunch of parameters. So we specify the identity, um, the messaging bus, uh, the type of funder, the type of adjudicator, which wallet is being used, and the watcher, um, which is um, basically the service for consuming on-chain events. Uh, it can also be an external service. That is why we moved it out of the adjudicator at some point. Um, yeah, then we need to start some, some handlers so that we can receive res uh, requests from other clients and consume blockchain events. And um, yeah, then for creating, uh, setting up a new channel, we propose, uh, we created a ledger channel proposal, which is a channel that sits directly on layer one. We can also create virtual channels, which sit on top of other channels, but the most simple um, uh, type is the ledger channel. We specify the parameters like the initial balances, which asset types and so on. Uh, and then we run the channel proposal protocol, including the funding and so on, by calling proposed channel. And if that doesn't error, we have a new channel that we can work with. Um, yeah, and once we have a channel object, we can now uh, define an update logic. So that works as follows. We have a function um, that gets its input pointed to a channel state. And then we can call on the channel object we call update by with the parameter um, of that function. And um, once uh, the function returns, update by returns, we are ensured that this uh, off-chain update has been um, enforced, uh, has been agreed by all parties. Um, if we get an error, so for example, if one party doesn't uh, reply, uh, then we have a, a dispute case and um, settle is the final operation from a user perspective, from a developer's perspective that will use our library. And settle will make sure that either in the dispute case, we run the dispute protocol or in the optimistic case, we will just conclude the channel and withdraw the funds. And yeah, as I said, um, especially regarding the initialization, there is quite a bunch of work to do. It's also blockchain specific, how you set up the individual components, but the other parts are actually um, more or less what you would actually write when you write an application with Perun. Okay, and yeah, which applications could you think of? So what would be potential use cases. Uh, one potential use case that Bosch is particularly looking at is um, building this technology in embedded devices, for example, to enable machine-to-machine -machine payments. So here, the example is shown um, for making payments to a, an electric charging station. Maybe the user would have a cell phone that provides um, so, so maybe the car itself, the embedded device, doesn't have a blockchain connection, but the user would have a cell phone which communicates with the embedded device and thereby enables uh, blockchain connectivity um, while still enabling the car to do micropayments. Maybe for each kilowatt hour or something like that, you can do an ind individual payment without any delays. And then once uh, the charging process is finished, you settle uh, at some point later against the blockchain when there's connectivity or uh, yeah basically when the yeah when when the blockchain so um, yeah as, as long as you have the off-chain guarantee um, you can do the settlement anytime you like basically so we, maybe you could even already um, leave the charging station and the um, charging station would take care of the settlement or something like that um, yeah, then I mentioned uh, the collaboration with Ayuna, who is a gaming platform provider. It's also a startup, so they are also in the early phases, but their vision is that they have a gaming developer platform which is integrated with Unity or Unreal Engine. I think currently they focus on Unity and they want to make it easy for game developers to 
um, yeah, to write an application that uses blockchain without the complexity. And they were running into the problem. So they basically already had a scaling solution based on a trusted execution environment, but they couldn't go below latency of 500 milliseconds or something like that. And um, since Perun state channels are peer-to-peer, -peer, you have almost no la noticeable latency. It's like running a normal game. And I don't know if I have time, probably not, but we also have a demo. We will publish it soon. Um, where there's a simple tic-tac-toe game played in a state channel, you can really see there's, there's basically no, no, lat no noticeable latency. So this basically, here uh, Perun sits on top of their existing scaling technology and additional and enabling like really low latency applications. Um, yeah, then we have the cross-chain use cases. So since um, we have integrated different blockchains. Um, we can also enable, uh, and, and the protocols are capable of that, we can enable cross-chain swaps. So for example, if you think, um, I hinted at this use case earlier, if you think one client has Ether and he wants to uh, swap it against a Polkadot tokens, he can connect with a liquidity provider and do a trustless token swap. So there's no trust involved. Um, there's no trusted intermediary necessary. Um, you can swap tokens against each other and either the swap happens or not and you can even do it thousands of times. So maybe if you think of two big banks that want to do a lot of swaps between each other before they settle, that could be a viable application here. At the moment, um, I should note, we only support uh, swaps between two um, networks that, that are of the same type. So it could be two um, Ethereum-based networks this specific use case, Ethereum to Polkadot, is something um, that requires the same cryptographic mechanisms to be available on both cha the chains, the same, um, the same serialization to be available, and that just requires more work on the implementation side. So that's something currently we focus on EVM to EVM or fabric to fabric or yeah, same types of networks on both sides. Uh, another nice use case that uh, is in the realm of decentralized identities. So here we look at an example where uh, there's an authority, maybe a notary, who provides a certificate service and once expects some payment. And now maybe there's not enough trust that um, the authority provides the, uh, wants to provide the certificate before the payment, but the user also doesn't want to provide the payment before the certificate but um, we can basically use um, a swap mechanism. We could maybe do it with, with a hash time lock, but we can also program it into a Perun channel so that you can do a lot of swaps um, in, in short succession. Again, potentially maybe between two big companies that sell or exchange certificates against payments. Uh, so there's no uh, risk involved in that because it's now an atomic transaction that we can program into the channel but it's still very efficient so we can do thousands of transactions of that type uh, between enti two entities. And the middle term goal is that we actually uh, want to, we have a proof of concept for that ready and we are looking at integrating that with the Hyperledger areas protocols. So yeah, I think uh, we're pretty much at time. Um, so, yeah, Perun, the Perun framework is a toolkit for enabling scalability and interoperability among block blockchains. It's based on state channel technology. It enables low latency, high throughput, it is modular, and is based on peer reviewed research. Um, you can find more about the Perun project at GitHub when you go to Hyperledger Labs. You find um, yeah, the repository is there when you search for Perun. We also have a bit of developer documentation where you can go through tutorials, play with it. And yeah, if you are interested, reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to, to get yeah, interest, contributions, maintainers, whatever. Happy to talk to you. We have a Discord channel at the Hyperledger Discord. Um, but you can also find us via these links. And with that, thanks for 
your attention and happy to take any questions. He was the first. <laughs> Um, it's a good question. So we have exploring um, a concept where it's customizable, but the library as it's published, so as it's on the main publishment branch, it, um, it, you always have to pre-fund because only that way you don't need to trust the other parties. But it's not that hard to customize it. Um, so I did a proof of concept where we only partially fund the channel. So, for example, if you have some trust involved, you could say maybe you reference a funding pool and if there's not enough funding for uh, the, the, the final settlement, then the funding from one party will be taken from an authorized funding pool, which has the risk that the pool may run dry at some point, but you can actually start transacting without any on-chain interaction if you, if you trust in that. So that enables off-chain payments, for example, where you can still track whose balances are what. So you have some, some verifiability of which transactions have been done, uh, but you get kind of off-chain, uh, so offline payment functionality. So uh, if you are interested, I can point, we have a Medium blog post about this, which also references to the code. Yeah. Yeah, so any party can trigger it. So in the optimistic case, one party proposes to close the channel and then the settlement will be just one on-chain transaction. And usually we split the settlement from the withdrawal. So at some point, um, the on-chain state will be concluded and there's no change possible, but individual parties can withdraw it to their accounts whenever they like. Um, if you have a dispute, so you couldn't settle the channel off-chain, you couldn't finalize the state off-chain, um, then the dispute period um, until you have to wait uh, that the settlement can be done is configurable. And that's, um, I guess, depending on the blockchain that you use, uh, depending on the application, it can be minutes or seconds, minutes or, or days maybe even. So. That's uh, a parameter that you specify when you open the channel. Yeah. It also goes into the uh, unique channel ID. Um, yeah, so you can specify it whenever you open. Sorry. <laughs> you Yeah, I'm uh, good that you point me to fast fabric because I'm not aware of that, but I'm aware of like in general the space of roll-ups and so on. That's something that we that we are aware of. Um, in terms of throughput, what we benchmarked on our normal computers is about two to three thousand transactions per second. But I think if you tune it a little bit, maybe you can even go faster. Um, really, what just what you just need to do is in case of a two-party channel, two signatures, and the network communication. So um, from a computational perspective, it should be like anything, like it, it depends probably on your round-trip time on the network. Yeah. So in the realm of thousands of transactions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. What yeah. do I write? Where do I put it? Where's the logic enforced bilaterally? Mm -hmm. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, so basically we have an injection point um, in our, so let's say we are on Ethereum. And then we have our Ethereum smart contract and we have an injection point where you can 
in the dispute protocol inject arbitrary transaction logic. So when you open a channel, you specify this is a ch channel with custom transaction logic. And then when the dispute protocol runs, um, there's an additional phase that checks does the channel have um, customized transaction logic. And then it will um, call a separate contract. So like you deploy your tic-tac-toe contract separately and it has a valid transition function. So basically how the tic-tac-toe contract must look like, you specify what is a valid transition from one game state to the next one. And so what our Peru smart contract will then do, uh, it will check, it would call the, the tic-tac-toe contract with the current state and the proposed next state and um, the signature from one party. There must be at least one party that, uh, yeah. Let me just recall yeah. if I understand it correctly, because it's important to me because I'm thinking about the application. So I essentially write a, say, Solidity smart contract. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Put it on the main net mm -hmm. or play. Whatever, one. exactly. Yeah. I have this Perun contract that points to that state machine that this Exactly. We can use that to verify. Exactly. And the part is uh, try to perform the valid Exactly. Test. And if one of them sees that uh -huh, he tried to cheat, then can call out to the layer one. Exactly. And the layer one uses that state machine to see yeah. whether this is... Exactly. Valid. We call it force move because now you have a method of enforcing logic that was predefined in comparison to just having to rely on a full consensus of chain. So B yeah. may try to uh, cheat and A has to be able to uh, detect that B through yeah, exactly, the yeah. but then they can rely exactly. on the layer one SNR. Exactly, that. yeah. <laughs> so, nice. I don't know. I saw your hand raised. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I just wanted to continue on this. So, but anyways, at the end of this, at, at, at the end of the life cycle of the channel, you somebody will, will have to check so that uh, nobody cheated, right? So That's cheated. also an interesting so point. Yeah. yeah, we don't guarantee, like, if both parties are cheating, you don't have a reliable outcome. Like, the, you couldn't rely as a yeah. third party that they played everything correct, that would involve maybe an, an unrelated third party in the channel. All right. So that's also, but it, like if you, if you think about swaps or some like chess game or something like that, then you want to make sure that you're not betrayed. But um, of course, if, if, if they just tell, okay, this person won and it didn't even play the game, then there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's an, not so much. Yeah, we have mostly do, done put two party tests, um, but not so much like the network uh, aspects. That would be also interesting to see. Yeah. I, I saw this. <laughs> there's one in the back as well. And then. Yeah, but between the two parties in the channel, you have the guarantee that whatever you agree on, you can settle at any point in time. So it's up to you, basically. Um, I mean, you can do it for, like, I think the typical point in time would be you want to use the funds that are locked into the channel in a different uh, use case. So you want to transfer the funds. Yeah, a do a payment outside of the Perun channel. Then you want to close the channel and settle it. Um, but there's no need to settle the channel because uh, maybe you are you fear of losing your funds. As long as the channel is open and you still uh, remember what the most recent state was, <laughs> this is also persistence is important. Um, yeah, but for example, maybe you want to do checkpoints for persistence reasons. That that could be a good a good point. Yeah. So yeah. So more often in typical use cases that we deal with in real world, it, apart from exchange, I mean, exchange
exchanges between two parties, it also becomes mandatory for some use cases where we'll have to expose some parameters to a, let's say, a third party that could be a regulatory agency mm -hmm. which is monitoring transactions between two people. Yeah. So how do we fix those use cases and take care yeah. of yeah, it seems at first that this is kind of contrary and sometimes we were also pitching the technology as a private uh, channel because, as you say, you only re see the result, the settled result on the blockchain, but you don't necessarily uh, see the individual transaction. But what you could do, for example, you could maybe, so there is an arbitrary data field that you can fill in the channel state, so maybe you could populate that with a transaction history or something like that and make it so you could maybe even do some additional proof logic uh, program it into the channel logic um, yeah and basically enforce the correct transaction history i don't have a like thought through answer for this but you like the basic thing that you just track an addition of the balances you track the individual transactions that's something that you can surely do um, i don't know if it's like how verifiable that is in the end against a, a third party auditor, for example. But that's. There is a possibility of doing that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One last question, if you don't mind. So, is this <laughs> integrated currency only with Ethereum, or is, this, is that available for integration with other blockchains? Yeah, as I said, so um, this, these are the blockchains. So, um, this is life, this is life, this is life, this is life. Um, with different feature sets, so virtual channels, for example, so channels on top of channels we currently only have here. Um, channels with customized transaction logic we have in Polkadot now. Um, Cardano and Definity are in development. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I think we have to, <laughs> I don't know, we can discuss offline because we know each other. Yeah.